All right, let's turn to Joel chapter 2 once again. We covered some of this last week. I want to read most of chapter 2 again and kind of look at some different parts of this chapter. Joel chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Hey, I praise God that He has led you in providence to this YouTube channel. My name is Ralph Blake, and I'm the Bible teacher. God, I believe in grace, has given to me the gift of teaching. And for 50 years, I have been seeking to use that gift for His glory. And our desire in this YouTube channel is to win the loss to Jesus Christ and help believers to grow in the knowledge and faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies, exposition of the scriptures, topical Bible studies. Every week, with God's help, we upload new Bible studies and I hope that you'll hit subscribe I hope that you'll join us all right let's get our Bibles and study together remember the chapter or yes remember chapter one is about the plague of the locusts and the drought that were coming upon the land of Judah and uh, being a great devastation to them just laying the land waste and bare uh, no food no water no crops no harvest uh, the animals were suffering the people were suffering and a great plague of locusts and other insects, depending on how we want to look and interpret the words. Uh, <coughs> he calls it, in verse 15 of chapter 1, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, uh, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. He is talking about this as a day of the Lord, as a day of the Lord's wrath and destruction, but it's a type and a figure of the coming great day of the Lord, which is yet to come in our day as well. But he's going to continue on with this in chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong there hath not been ever like, neither shall any be after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them as a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen shall they run. Like the noise of chariots and the tops of the mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every man in on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall anyone thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them and the heavens shall tremble, and the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, and for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with, all your, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, let that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they, lay, should they say among the people, Where is their God? We'll read a little bit more in a moment, but let's pause there. All right, here we have the day of the Lord as it is in type and figure. It is, it is a great day of tragedy and devastation at that time, at the time of Joel's writing in the land of Judah. A day of the, the day of the Lord cometh. Uh, not the ultimate day of the Lord, which is yet future and will be at the Lord's second coming. 
uh, when he will bring, you know, the day of the Lord speaks of God's wrath. It speaks of God's judgment uh, upon a nation or at the ultimately upon the world. The Lord is going to judge the, the world. And we'll talk more about that, especially as we get further into chapter 2 and then into chapter 3 again. Uh, he's going to talk about those things. But the day of the Lord is also going to be a prefiguring here of another, you know, there, it's like, it's like John the Baptist, first, or excuse me, the Apostle John said in the first epistle of John, he says, there are many, many antichrists in the world, but then he says there is the antichrist. Well, there's going to be many times it could be called the day of the Lord, but then there's going to be the day of the Lord. All right, there's those that are an, a, a preface to the real ultimate day of the Lord, and they're used as a type, as a simile, as a, as a, as a figure of that coming day of the Lord, but they are a day of God's visitation even at that time, but not as the ultimate will be. Uh, but it is a day, as it says, destruction from the Almighty. That's the basic concept of the idea of the day of the Lord. It's a day of God's wrath and visitation of ungodly, unrepentant people and His creation. That's what it's about. And that's what He's using this plague of locusts and insects as like. Uh, as, as Revelation 16, 14, talking about the coming ultimate day of the Lord, is called the day of God Almighty. The day of God Almighty, which we talked about last week, is similar to the day of the Lord. Um, it is going to be, the, uh, the, the final day of the Lord is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble, and according to other prophecies, it's going to be a time of the final gathering of the people of the world of judgment by the Lord God. And it's going to be a time of great tribulation, which the book of Revelation goes into in detail, as other prophecies do as well. And Daniel and the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, they both say, unless the Lord shorten those days, no flesh should be saved. Such is going to be the day of the Lord. It's going to be such terrible judgments and devastation upon a world of rebellious sinners that unless God would shorten those days, no one would survive. That's what Daniel 12 says and Matthew 24 both say. Um, here he gives in chapter 2 here, these verses we read here, he's giving a description of this, this infestation, this plague of insects, the locusts and the others that followed behind them or the different stages of the locusts if you want to interpret it that way. Uh, but we interpreted it before as different four different kinds of insects that came in one after the other. And uh, he's using them as a type of a great army that's going to come in. Uh, like a great army. They're just going to march. They're just going to come through. And he talks about the great... Um, he says the verse... Um, you know, the appearance, he says, their appearance is as the appearance of horses. And I was reading uh, John MacArthur's commentary just this morning on this chapter, and he, and he brought out, and, and we've probably, you've probably noticed somewhere, you know, if you, if you look at a detailed descriptive photo of a locust, there is a similarity to the head of a horse, you know, and, and, and he's using that as, as illustration, because remember, in the days of the Old Testament, the ultimate instrument in warfare was a horse. If you had a huge cavalry, you had a huge advantage. That's why you find, and when we were going through the books of the Kings and the Chronicles, when this when the when the Egyptians came, or when the other Saint armies would come in, and they would say, and they had so many men, and they had so many horses and chariots. Because if you had horses and chariots, that's a big advantage over foot soldiers. Okay, and so he's comparing this. Um, and by the way, we'll get to the point here when we're talking about the coming day of the Lord, when they're talking about 200 million horsemen. Well, that's not going to be literally fulfilled because there are 200 million horses in the world. There never have been 200 million horses in the world. There's nowhere near that many horses in the world. The number 200 million is just a number to show us that this is going to be some massive army that we can't really fathom. Okay, that's the idea. Not, not a literal number. Uh, I, you know, because no one can put 200 million horses on a battlefield. There aren't that many horses in the world. They don't exist. So, uh, you know, some of it is symbolic, obviously. You know, and some of it is literal, and some of it is symbolic. And, you know, I was taught when I was in Bible college many, 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 many years ago, uh, one of the rules of Bible interpretation is if the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense. But sometimes the plain sense doesn't make sense, and okay, this is symbolic. 
Okay, this is a typical, this is, this is a type or a figure. All right, but if the plain sense makes sense, then just go with that because that's probably what God means. All right, uh, but here he's using this, and by the way, he talks about uh, the clouds, the sky being darkened, and, and he says in verse 3, the noise of the chariots on the top, like the noise of chariots on the top. Listen, if you've got millions of locusts flying in, they are going to make a noise. They're going to make a noise. And they're going to, they're going to dark, the sky's going to get dark. It's going to be a shadow. They're just going to block out the sun and that where they're flying through these, th I mean, have you ever been where you've seen birds, where they, you know, you've seen the, the blackbirds where they fly and just sometimes you see just tens of thousands of them in big flocks and they're flying and sometimes it's just cool to watch them, how they move around. But if they're flying between you and the sun, I mean, you're in the shade all of a sudden. They're blocking out the sun. Well, if you've got millions and millions of these insects flying in, not only are they going to make a lot of noise, they're going to make that place dark while they're coming in. And he says they're climbing up the walls, they're going into the houses, they're going, listen, these insects are going everywhere, they're going to eat everything. And it's a symbol of the troops that are going to come in, and they're going to come into the cities, they're going to break down the walls, they're going to come in, and they're going to break down the houses, and they're going to kill and destroy. And as we talked about before, in the subsequent uh, days to Joel, uh, we had the Assyrians and the Babylonians and other great armies came in. And these are types and figures from this plague here, but also types and figures of the greater war that's going to come when God is going to bring the armies of the world together to the Battle of Armageddon, which we can talk about more next week probably. Um, signs in the heaven, again pointing forward, he says, look there at verse... Uh, Chapter 2, verse 31, says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before them. Uh, that, you find similar phrases in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, uh, at the, the, the final day of the Lord there. Notice as we pointed out before, verse 11 says, They are called the Lord's army. The Lord's army. Why? Because He's the sovereign ruler. He's the one who is bringing this judgment upon the people of Judah. He is the one who's bringing them in. They are coming at his command. Uh, they are the Lord's army. Uh, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Who can abide it, says the Lord. Um, let me just read over what Jesus said very quickly in Matthew 24, just to read these couple of verses. They're familiar to us, but I want to just read them very quickly. Chapter 24, verse 21, Jesus says this in Matthew 24, For then shall come the great tribulation, which was not since the, and since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's going to be the ultimate. And this, is a, this devastation in the time of Joel is a type and a figure of that which is to come. You know, we mentioned last week, and this is what the prophets of old and the preachers of the New Testament preached of God's wrath, preached of God's judgment, preached of God's holiness. And as we said last week, we just do not have enough of that in our world today. We just do not have enough preaching of God's wrath and hatred of sin. And yes, God is love. And we're going to see here in just a moment. God is merciful and gracious. But everybody thinks that God is just some big mushy teddy bear in the sky that is never going to punish anyone. Nothing could be further from the truth. We read of the vengeance of God. We read of the wrath of God. We read of the anger and hatred of God against sin and against the ungodly in the scriptures. These are things that, if you, if you went to the internet today and you pulled up a thousand sermons, you probably wouldn't find three of them on those topics. But you'd probably find 500 on the love of God. And the love of God is great. 
Don't misunderstand. The love of God is fantastically wonderful and great beyond our full comprehension. But the love of God cannot be properly understood until we understand the wrath of God and the holiness of God and the justice of God. If we don't understand that, we can't put the love of God into proper context. It just becomes sentimental nothing. Because that's what people... You see, the idea of people today, my wife and I have been talking about this because of our neighborhood and so forth, but I don't want to say much. But, you know, there are people in the world who have love without any discernment. Love without any judgment or any common sense attached to it. Well, that's just sentimental nut mush. It's not real love. When we went through the book of Philippians, remember uh, the, the prayer of the apostle for the church in Philippi was that their love would grow in knowledge and discernment. Our love needs to grow with knowledge and discernment. Our love needs to... You see, that's what true love is. And the mercy of God is only mercy when we understand His wrath, when we understand His judgments. So he's talking about this plague like a great army. Let's go to verse 12. He says, therefore, now he's calling them to a solemn assembly, calling them to repent. Notice, notice what he says here. He says, therefore, also now saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Turn to me. Use, you see, this calamity, the prophet of God is using as a means or an, an occasion to call the people to repentance, to call the people to humble themselves before God. Fasting is a humbling before God. And the mourning and, and the weeping is, a, is an outward manifestation of their grief and their godly sorrow, which is the evidence of true repentance. You see, godly sorrow, true repentance has godly sorrow for sin. It's yes, a change of mind, but it's a change of mind and of the will. He says, rend your heart and not your garments. The Old Testament Jews to show a sign of great calamity or extreme devastation or extreme heartbreak. They would tear their clothes as a sign of great sorrow and great woe. And the prophet of God is saying, look, I don't want these outward symbols. I want you to turn with your heart. I want the real thing. Not just a show, not just, oh, walk down an aisle and sign a card and say a prayer and get baptized. No, but truly repent with godly sorrow. Isaiah the prophet. Um, let's see, I wrote that down somewhere. Isaiah, oh yeah, uh, Isaiah, go over to Isaiah chapter 1, just back. Isaiah, this is about 50 years later. Isaiah the prophet is prophesying. And he's going to use similar... Uh, a similar idea here, but talking about not just with your words, not just with your outward actions, but in, in, in a show of repentance, but really turn to God from your heart. Really, he says, let's uh, just read a couple verses in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, Isaiah says, From the sole of your foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither wound, bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Look, he's describing their spiritual condition. <laughs> you people are spiritually sick and dead, or dying as he describes them here. But we all understand New Testament describes us spiritually already dead. But he's describing their spiritual... Look, you're on life support here. You're, you're, there's no ointment, there's no medication, there's nothing. And he says then down in verse 11, he says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or the lambs or he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling assemblies, I cannot, away, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. For your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes 
from you. When ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil from your doings before mine eyes and cease to do evil. Isaiah is going into more detail about exactly what Amos is saying. He's saying, look, don't just rend your garments, rend your heart. God is saying it through the prophet Isaiah. Now he's prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel 50 years after the time of Amos. And he's saying, look, God says to the people, he says, look, your sacrifices mean nothing to me because your heart is not right. I, they, I hate your sacrifices. They are an abomination to me. Now, to put that in, in application to our New Testament time, it's like people going to church and putting tithes in the offerings and putting money in the offering plate and, and saying prayers and getting baptized and doing things, but their heart has never truly turned to God. God says, it means nothing to me. Just quit wasting your time. Just quit wasting your time. What you need to do is cease from sin and seek me with your whole heart. As Amos says, back in Amos, he says, with your whole heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, and he, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. You know, God is merciful. God is gracious. I'm going to read back in Exodus 34. Familiar passage. In Exodus 34. Verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgressions of sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. But when God revealed Himself to Moses on the mountain, how did God reveal Himself? He said, the Lord, the Lord God. Now, He had already revealed Himself in the commandments as a holy God. He, he had already come down with blackness and lightning and thunder, and the people were scared to death. And they were, I mean, the people down on the ground, they were scared, the Bible says. They didn't want to come near the mountain because a holy God was there and He gave them His holy commandments. But God now is also going to reveal Himself to Moses. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. Psalm, let me just read a couple of David's Psalms. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. One more, Psalm 145. There are many, many scriptures that teach this truth in the scriptures. Psalm 145, verse number 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. This is what, this is what Joel is saying to the people of his day. He's saying, hey, call a solemn assembly and, and, and weep and mourn and lament and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn to the Lord. Why? Because God's merciful. If you turn to Him, God's going to be merciful. If you repent of your sin, if you turn from your sin, God is, is merciful. Um, he says in verse 14, Who knoweth if He will return and repent? I'm not going to go into that too much at this point, but well, let me... Let me uh, let me just talk about this, God repenting. All right, let's just, let's just bring that out just for a few minutes here. Um, now, God never changes His purpose or the counsel of His will. Let me read Numbers chapter 23, just to make this exceedingly clear. Numbers 23, verse 19. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that He should lie, neither the Son of man that He should repent, Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? When God's will is set, when God has said what he's going to do, it can't, it's, it's not going to, you, you, God doesn't lie. It's not going to change. 
Dr. Gill on this verse here in God repenteth him of the evil and God turning away. He says, not that God ever changes the counsel of his will, but alters the course of his providence and the manner of his conduct toward men according to his unalterable counsel. Repentance otherwise does not properly belong to God. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18 just for a few moments. In Jeremiah chapter 18. See how Jeremiah describes this. Jeremiah 18. You see, the way to interpret Scripture is with the Scriptures. You've got to put it in the context of the whole Bible. You can't take one little part out of the Bible and say, oh, well, what do you... Because see, some Bible scoffers could take this verse that talks about God repenting of the evil and God changing His mind, and they're, and they're going to mock the sovereignty of God. They're going to mock the things of God because they're not putting it into proper context and understanding it in, as it should be understood. But in uh, Jeremiah 18, beginning in verse 7, well, let me start in verse 6. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced to turn their evil, I will repent, and the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build it and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. He's talking about God's providence dealing with nations and with individuals. Look, not talking about His eternal counsels and, and what we need to understand is almost all of God's threats and almost all of God's promises are conditional threats are conditional upon repentance God says here through the prophet Jeremiah look if I say to a nation that I'm going to bring this judgment upon you and I'm going to bring that destruction upon you and I'm going to do this but if they repent God says okay I'm not going to do it or if he says, look, I say I'm going to bring a blessing upon this nation. I'm going to, I'm going to prosper this people. But if they turn away and, and rebel against me, he says, well, okay, I'm not going to do that. They're not going to get those blessings. God is consistent. He doesn't repent in the fact that he needs to change his mind, but he's going to repent in, the, in how he deals with us according to his eternal purposes. His eternal purposes haven't changed. He's still going to deal with, according to his faithfulness and according to his mercy he's still going to deal with us uh, Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 let me just read Jonah very quickly here Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 this is why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh this is the very reason Jonah said I don't want to go and he, and he got on a ship going the opposite direction and ended up in the fish's belly you know why? Look what Jonah says here in chapter 4, verse 2. This is after he's preached. He finally got there. And after he preached about God's wrath and judgment coming to them, and after they repented and they turned to the Lord, and God turned away his wrath from the city of Nineveh, this is what Jonah says in chapter 4, verse 2. But this thing is risen, verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, that is a strange verse that you could preach a long time on. Here's a man of God upset because God did not destroy these people. I mean, that's an interesting verse, folks, but we'll just go from there. Verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled from before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Lord, I know that you just desire to do good if people would only repent. I knew that. I knew that you're ultimately a gracious, merciful, long-suffering God. I knew that. That's why I didn't want to come preach to these people, God. Because I was afraid that they would turn from their sin and you would spare them. And you didn't. Now I'm upset about it. I mean, what a strange prayer this is, folks. What, I mean, Jonah is a great study in, in human nature. This prophet of God. You know, the prophets of God were holy men, yes, but they were just men. They weren't perfect and sinless. Because to understand Jonah's attitude, now you've got to understand, these were nation, an enemy nation. But nevertheless, 
to, to, to have a man of God upset and angry because God spared hundreds of thousands of lives? That's kind of weird. But he was. He was angry. But the very reason he did not want to go to Nineveh and preach because he says, God, I know that you're gracious and merciful and I was afraid that this is exactly what was going to happen. This is what Joel is saying. Turn to the Lord God, for He is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. If you would repent, if you would repent, you would find would be gracious. He says, who knows, in verse 14. Now, Joel knew and has already said that God is gracious and merciful slow to anger, so forth. There's a promise of God that if sinners repent and turn to the Lord with their heart in faith, God will forgive them. That's a promise, Old and New Testament. If sinners repent and trust in the Lord, they shall be saved. What he is saying here, is God, look, God might even turn away this physical devastation from us. Oh yes, He will definitely forgive our sins, but who knows, God might even turn away this plague if we repent. Now, I don't think He had a direct promise on that point, but He said, who knows? It's like, you know, when David was... Uh, <sighs> Let me read a couple of verses in 2 Samuel. Because I, 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 I want to... We have to understand these things in a biblical context. 2 Samuel, chapter number 12. Remember David sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery with another man's wife. She became pregnant, and David, and she bore a child, and God said, David, this child's going to die. Let me read a little bit of that in uh, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die, howbeit because this deed that thou hast done has given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David, you've repented. God's forgiven you your sins. But your sins are still going to have consequences. The child's going to die. Go down to verse 16. David therefore besought God for the child. And he fasted and prayed that God would spare the child. The prophet had already said the child's going to die. Um, well, let me just keep reading. The elders, now, I don't have time to read all of that. The elders of the house were saying, look, he's fasting and praying and, and while this child is dying. Finally, the child does die. And they come and tell David. And they were afraid to tell David because they thought he'd just be beside himself with grief when they finally found out the child was dead. And they told him the child was dead. The Bible says David got up, washed his face, and put on his clothes, and quit mourning, and quit crying, and quit praying. And the people, what in the world? And David says, well, God might have shown mercy. God might have spared that child. So while the child was alive, I was going to keep praying and begging God for mercy. Now, it wasn't God's will at that point in David's life to show mercy in that situation. So the prophet Joel says, who knows? Yes, if you repent and turn to God, your sins will be cleaned. Just like David's sins were gone, but just like David prayed also for the result of the sins to be gone to it. Joel, Joel says to the people, who knoweth if he will repent and leave a blessing behind him? Look, God may not completely wipe out everything. He might leave a little bit. Who knows? Who knows? It says in verse 18. Let me just finish this part here. We read down to verse 17. 
He's calling them to repentance. He says, look, get the young, get the old, get, the, get everybody. He says in verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast. I mean the infants, everybody, even those who are newly married. He said, look, they can wait and consummate their marriage later. Let them come and pray. Let them come. And, this is more important than anything. That's what he's saying. This is more important than anything. Let the priests and the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Verse 18 begins with the word, Then, if you will do what I'm calling you to do, if you will humble yourselves and truly repent and truly turn to God, if you do that, then will the Lord be jealous for His land. Notice it's His land. And pity His people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto His people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far from you the northern army, and will drive him into the land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea, and his stink shall come up, and all uh, ill sa savor shall come up, because he had done great things." Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain. Moderately he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent unto you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am in the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Now, at the beginning here in verse 18, the prophet of God is talked about this great devastation. He's called the people to repentance, to humble themselves before God. He says, look, if you do this thing, and he's going to talk now about then God is going to give you physical restoration. He's going to physically restore the land to a place of blessing. That's what's described here in verses 19 to 27. And then in verses 28 to 32, which we'll get to next week, he's going to talk about uh, being spiritual restoration. And then from all of chapter 3 is national restoration. This is all, now we're getting into the real prophetic part of the book of Joel. He's talking about the time of the second coming of Christ. When they're going to be, once again, brought back into the land. And they're going to be a prosperous nation. And they're going to have their enemies are going to be destroyed by the coming King and Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, what's, that's what we have here. But this section that we just read, he said, look, if you do these things, then God is going to restore the land. God is going to, you're going to, you're going to have land flowing with milk and honey. Once again, it's going to be restored. That's what's going to happen. Then be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice. Because remember, as he says here, it's God's land and God's people. And as we preached a few weeks ago when Pastor was gone, uh, going through the, 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 the different, test, different scriptures of the Old Testament problem, you cannot separate the land and the people. Right. You can't separate them. When God's going to restore Israel, He's going to restore the land and the people yeah. in the land. That's what the odd and the post millennials don't get. Right. Yeah. That's, 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 that's one of the foundational elements of premillennialism. Is you don't you can't separate those things and and this is God's land and God's people and one day he's gonna bring them back into that land and he's gonna restore them under the Messiah the King but here he's using this present situation in the day of Joel as a type and a figure of that which is to come as a type and a figure um, well we'll get into the end of this chapter next week about the spiritual outpouring of God's Holy Spirit and the restoration of the land the nation um, he says in verse 27, he's, this is kind of the transitional here. He says, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed.